Are you anxious about the future? Do you want to prepare for change and what's to come? Futurist Peter Bishop will share his research on what to expect so you can be ready. Next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Are you prepared for the future? Dr. Peter Bishop can help. He is the chair of the United States' first graduate degree on the future at the University of Houston. He shares how change can impact you and your organization. He specializes in techniques for long-term forecasting and planning and facilitates groups in developing scenarios, visions, and plans for the future. He'll tell us how to face technological change and global competition, the jobs of the future, and what you can do to best prepare for the transformations that lie ahead. Dr. Bishop, thank you for joining us. It's great to be here, Patty. Thank you for having me. I, I think most people wonder, what exactly do you study when you study the future? Well, we study all part periods of time. We study the past because that's where change has occurred. Mm -hmm. We study the present about what is going on today and what the conditions for change will be. And then, of course, we, we extrapolate and we also speculate about what could happen in the future. So we're going to start speculating here. Let's Good. talk about major technological transformations that we need to prepare for. What are they? Well, the one that's going on right now, of course, is the information revolution that you and the journalistic community is suffering under <laughs> and are <laughs> benefiting from. So, uh, sure, the new, the new information technologies, which really came on and started to affect the world oh, around 1980 with the right. PC and the Apple and all of that. And it's, it's not over yet. We've got another 10 or 20 years. But these things don't last forever. I mean, just like electricity was such a technological transformation, so now it's taken for granted it's everywhere. So the web and, and wireless and all of that 20, 30 years from now will just be everywhere and our grandkids will go, well, you know, what was the big deal? Isn't it just there? It's, so it takes a long time. Then the question, of course, is what's next? Right. Uh, there are various candidates. My candidate is biotechnology the ability to basically manipulate living things the way we manipulate material things today. I mean, we can create electronic circuits of infinite complexity and miniaturization, but we really haven't figured out how to do that with the living cell mm -hmm. or, a, or an organism. And I think uh, by the end of the century, we will have mastered that technique. Now, every technology brings enormous opportunity. It also brings tremendous risk. So it's not something that we jump into and say, wow, this is the magic bullet, but it could affect not only human health, but agriculture. Uh, manufacturing, recycling, all right, of that, right. when we finally harness the power of living organisms, uh, the potential is really amazing. Now, I'm interested in broadcast television. Do you foresee that disappearing in the next 20 years? Actually, no. Uh, what usually happens with older technologies, like radio, for instance, which was the broadcast medium, say, of the 1930s and 40s, uh, it, it it uh, takes on a different character. Basically, the new players, the new people at the table come on, like the Internet, and everybody else has to kind of move over and give up some of their space. But I don't think, see any medium going away completely, in, in my lifetime at least. Newspapers will still be there. There's, a, there's an advantage, but they won't be the primary source for a lot of young people, for instance. There will be a lot more multiple platforms exactly. to get information, as, as we see today. More complicated, more choices, which right. is in, isn't that what kind of one of the definitions of progress? Right. Now, in biotechnology, you, you mentioned some, some progress, but what are some examples of that? Can you give us some examples of what you foresee in the future in biotechnology? Well, in biotechnology, for instance, the ability to position uh, chemicals, for instance, drugs mm -hmm. or pharmaceuticals, on exactly the cell that it's going to go to rather than, I mean, right now, let's take, um, to use a completely different analogy, is, is warfare. Warfare used to be wholesale massacre. And even in Vietnam, we just basically bombed until we couldn't bomb anymore. Now we have these missiles that go right into the very window, and indeed we have the, the television pictures of them going into the very window. We don't have to lay down hundreds of bombs. We send missiles right in. Well, in biology, we're basically doing what we did in Vietnam. We're, we're carpet bombing the, the, all the cells of the body, and so particularly in cancer and chemotherapy, there's these reactions and side right, effects right. and awful things. If we could actually, like a laser-guided missile, target get just those cells. Well, that's that a matter. That would be incredible. I don't, I don't know that there's new technology has to be developed, but I think that's the kind of thing that we'll see. 
That's wonderful. Now tell me about jobs. People want to know about the jobs in the future. <laughs> what should I study now or what should my kids study now so that they'll have a job in the future? Right. Well, obviously jobs change as the technologies right. change. Right. So we're seeing a lot of job layoffs in the manufacturing industries. Not because we're doing less manufacturing. We're actually doing more manufacturing, but manufacturing has become more efficient so that it takes fewer person hours to produce X value of automobiles or washing machines or whatever. And in fact, all the other countries are going through that right now, too. So in manufacturing jobs, probably not. In the mm -hmm. service industry, a lot of that has gone away. My own prescription is two, for, particularly for students. One is to get as much technical e education as they possibly can. Like what? Well, engineering, medicine, biology, the sciences, mathematics. If they, if they, if they have the preparation, then they should try and get, particularly an undergraduate degree, as technical as possible, but don't take any more courses in those fields than they absolutely have to. Okay. Because that will get them in the door to a career. But, the, but progress, progressing in that career is going to be more their soft skills, their the ability to people deal skills. with people, right. and their ability to communicate, solve problems, work with others on a team, manage, supervise, all that kind of stuff. So a person, you know, the, the many of the, the most successful people in our world today were engineers or other kinds of technical degrees, but they're not practicing engineering anymore. They're using those kind of general skills. So technical with a long, a hard dose of the liberal arts. Now, uh, now we hear though specifically like healthcare will have jobs in the next 20, 30 years, biotechnology. I mean, what are the areas that uh, that we can consider going into and feel a little bit more comfortable well, with? Well, sure, as you've far touched on jobs. You know, healthcare is, 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 is a growing industry, mm -hmm. it's huge. Uh, I think uh, the energy industries uh, in general are going to be very big, particularly energy efficiencies. We live in a society, we've grown up in a society that has had abundant and inexpensive energy almost at our fingertips. And while that's not going to go away, we are going to have to be more careful about that than in the future. So energy efficiency and different kinds of what generally people call green technology, right. so recycling and all of that. Environmental science and environmental engineering, I think, would be a great career in the future. World trade? Uh, more so, uh, you know, we in the futures business don't give predictions. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so the scenario uh, there that is, is that we have been growing, and certainly world trade has been growing, but there's a scenario out there that we repeat, unfortunately, what happened in the 1930s, which is given the current economic crisis, will some countries decide to throw up barriers to each other's trade? And protection. Yeah, protectionism, which could then decrease the trade. So certainly we are a more global world than we ever were, so anything having to do with foreign language, anything having to do with anthropology and culture, with uh, business, international business, all of those, I gr would agree, are very good prospects. And that kind of answers my next question. People are concerned about this new globalized economy. How do we prepare for that? Well, well just obviously, right? I mean, understanding that, I mean, being aware of the fact that the world is out there and that it is influencing us. I mean, the United States, the huge country that it is and the huge power that it has in the world, oftentimes it's easy to think that we're kind of able to do anything we want. And unfortunately, we've made some mistakes, I think, with that assumption. Mm -hmm. We're part of a world community, uh, physically in the environment, uh, economically and in, in debt and trade and all of that, technologically. Uh, because we don't invent all the technologies, though we're very good at that. Others do do very well as also. So I think it's being aware of the world and realizing how we can best fit in, indeed lead, but not just by ourselves. And I was going to ask you, what does the United States need to do to remain the, the, the world superpower technologically, politically, socially? Well, in terms of technologically, obviously, that's innovation. And innovation comes out of two places. I think the universities, uh, obviously, and the research labs are very good, but they're very good at uh, what we might call incremental innovation, doing better what we already do. So. Uh, computer companies, for instance, will create better chips and put more transistors on a chip. But real innovation, transformative innovation, always comes from outside those sectors, from the entrepreneurs, from the people like uh, the people who invented the Apple II. And even the PC was invented by IBM, but it was invented in what was called a skunk works, a, right. a, a laboratory that was almost completely disconnected from the company. The Java language was invented uh, that same way. There were a bunch of guys, smart guys, were said, go off, six months later, come back with something cool. That was their only mission, and they created the Java language, which is a very big innovation. So it's on the one hand investing in traditional innovation, like research and development, right. but also allowing that entrepreneurs can, can get the money, can get the ideas, and can get the support to try. Now, we, we, we hurry on to say that most entrepreneurs fail. 
by a huge margin. Uh, those that succeed are the ones we know. We don't know the tens of thousands who tried to do something and, and for one reason or another because they were, didn't have the right technology or they didn't have enough money or whatever. So that is uh, two ways that the, you know, that the United States can keep the technological lead is by keeping a focus on innovation. Okay. Let's talk about global warming. I know you teach a, a course on, on climate change. How serious is the problem? Is it pretty much acceptable now that, that global warming is happening and it is caused by carbon dioxide or not? Well, I, and what I can believe, we do about it? I, uh, ten years ago, I would say the same thing. I think it is a real thing. It was, uh, has been measured over time. I don't think there's any more debate within the scientific community. There is some disagreement about the effect how much it will be, and therefore it's somewhere between 2 degrees and 5 degrees over perhaps 100 years. Uh, and therefore, uh, nobody really knows what the effects are. And that's where the discussion is. It's where the research is. Uh, drier conditions in the southwest part of the United States is uh, considered uh, pretty probable, pretty likely. And that's a part of the United States that can ill afford less water, even in one sense, because it's already pretty well using what resources it has, and it's growing. I mean, the mm -hmm. states like Arizona and New Mexico and Southern California are still growing, and they're going to need more water. So those are the kinds of things. Obviously, uh, along the coast, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, we're going to have uh, hurricanes that probably not more hurricanes, but more intense ones, uh, more cat higher categories and therefore higher rainfalls and, and more storm surges. So people with beachfront property are going to have to prepare for that and realize that they're at slightly higher risk than they were before. What, I mean, if you were to advise uh, the government or, or us in general, what would you say, this is how you need to prepare for this? Well, the source of global warming is the burning of fossil fuels. So there's a multi-pronged uh, approach. One is to reduce the amount of fossil fuels as much as possible by going to renewable sources of energy, even nuclear perhaps, if we can find a safe and inexpensive way of doing it. Uh, and then, of course, the efficiencies of the machines that we use, the automobiles and the home appliances and, and lighting and all of that, I think we're going to move in that direction. Other, other than that, uh, it's a matter of adapting to the changes that are probably already there. I mean, we've already put enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The, uh, the proportion of carbon dioxide is about 50 percent higher than it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So, uh, th and that's going to be there for many, many hundreds of years. So that, that acts like a blanket, and that blanket is going to continue to warm the planet. So we need to try and reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, and the new discussion of carbon taxes and cap-and-trade systems are designed to do that. They're moving in that direction. It's probably going to be a lot more significant in the long run uh, when we really have to try and mitigate the effects. And then we just have to adapt to whatever is there. What about, and you talked about carbon dioxide, what about moving away from oil? We hear some people are saying, look, peak oil. We're going to run out of oil, and if we don't run out of oil, we still need to start changing our ways. Right. Uh, what do you foresee happening there? Are we going to move away from a post-oil economy? Are we going to, to that? Well, there will be a post-oil economy. Of course, the debate is when. <laughs> Some people actually claim we've already touched peak oil. Uh, it turns out that right now, the peak production in the world occurred uh, f almost four years ago, in May of 2005. It's been kind of flat since then, but the actual technical peak was then. Will we exceed that peak? Well, right now, people are actually cutting back production. So one of the scenarios is that we've already passed the peak. The other problem, though, is that w it's not going to go away. It's going to become more expensive, and it's going to become less available because, uh, and therefore, more expensive. So we will adapt our changes, as we did when we were paying uh, $3 and $4 a gallon for gasoline. People thought about, wait a minute, do I really want to buy that big car? Do I really want to drive 25, 30 miles to work? But it's back down again. It's back down because again. Because low people, demand. But people didn't change their behavior, strangely. They're still, they know it's coming back. And in that sense, the behavior change now, if it stayed at $1.50 for two years, we would be back where we were. So mm -hmm. it is driven by the price, which is itself driven by the availability. Alternative sources of energy. You talked about nuclear. How, I mean, do we foresee that happening more? What are the challenges? I know France is, is very much ahead of us in, in this area. Uh, what are the challenges with nuclear energy, and do you foresee us going in that direction? Because we have to. <laughs> it's one of the many options that we have, and right now people are discussing all of those options. Well, the, f the prediction right now, the most likely, is that nuclear retains its share of the proportion of electricity it's produced, which is about 20 percent, which means that as we grow in electricity, we will grow some more nuclear. Actually, it's turned out that nuclear, while it's 
incredibly expensive to uh, build and to ma and it is actually quite inexpensive to operate. Nuclear plants have actually exceeded expectations in terms of how cheap it's been to actually produce the electricity and of course it's being produced 24 hours a day, 365, you know, don't need the wind, don't need the sun, it just right. basically goes ahead. The big problem with nuclear is of course the building waste. the plants uh, and the risk in terms of it's a dangerous material and we have to be very careful which therefore adds to the expense and the other is the waste. And what do we do with it? There's actually technologies to recycle and reuse that waste. They're called breeder reactors. And we considered those in the 1970s, but people were afraid that they would, uh, that, that new material would get into the wrong hands and for proliferation purposes. But I think some folks are beginning to rethink that. If we could take the waste that's there now and reprocess it and reuse it, then we would have a very strong. So I tend to be mildly optimistic about uh, nuclear as one of the, op not the, not the answer, but as one of the options. Do you believe that investing in green technology will create jobs? Absolutely. I, and, you know, if we do not have oil and, and so it's a, it's a twin uh, motivation. One is that the oil is probably not going to explode as it did in the 1980s and therefore the price drop off. So we're going to at least be level. And as we grow the energy, we're going to move to a more electric uh, society, less fossil fuel society. Electricity, however, is produced by coal, which is not very green, though we could try and capture the carbon. And then all the other sources like nuclear and wind and solar, which are don't produce carbon dioxide. So while we we move away from the fossil fuels to some extent, uh, we will move into the green technology. So jobs, yes, jobs and, and absolutely need lots of scientific research and development to make those technologies economically viable. Now we live, we can live without oil, uh, but we can't live without water. What is happening with water? I understand that is a resource that people are concerned about in the future. And what's happening with that? Well, water is stressed in many. It's it's more regional. It's not quite global because uh, in many parts of the world there's plenty. a lot of water, right. and in, mo in some parts of the world, in the drier parts, of course, there's quite a bit less. So our our view is that one of the what I hope is one of the major technological breakthroughs in water technology is called desalinization. It's taking seawater and taking out those things which make it seawater, turning it into fresh water. Right now, that's a very expensive process. It takes huge amounts of energy. New nanotechnology membranes, however, are on the horizon which might reduce the amount of energy uh, needed to desalinate water to more economical levels. It will, won't be the same as falling out of the sky and getting it essentially for free, but if we could produce water the way we produce other chemicals, uh, we would then be able to supplement the natural sources. In fact, uh, I, I found out that Nevada, of course, and Las Vegas, which is growing you know, by leaps and bounds, and having a tremendous amount of need for water, they actually uh, offered for to Los Angeles to buy them a desalinization plant if they could keep more of the water uh, that flows through Nevada goes on to California. So those are strategies that are being actively that are discussed right working. now. That, I don't know. Again, none of this is a complete solution, it all kind of mitigates the problem. Now you mentioned nanotechnology, that is a technology of the future. How hopeful are you in that? Well, uh, nanotechnology is there, it's really a further development. We've already gotten uh, very good at working with very small things. The difference between current material science and nanoscience is that in nanotechnology we're able to manipulate things at the atomic level. So we're basically up till now been dealing with batches pretty small batches mm -hmm. and you talk about computer circuits and things like that. But if we are able to actually manipulate things atom by atom, we can create very pure and very, very marvelous kind of substances and the list goes on and on. I don't think it's the same kind of global transformative technology that information has been or that biology is probably going to be, but we're going to have some very smart and very capable materials come out of nanotechnology in the next 20, 30 years. So w w what areas of life would nanotechnology impact? Well, just about everything. everything. I mean, uh, windows that, uh, that, that, cre that, that capture energy, for instance, a film that goes on the window that actually produces, helps uh, produce electricity for the home and at the same time cuts down on the sunlight coming through so it's uh, cheaper to cool. That's just one example. And, and nanotechnology, we talked about medicine already. Nanoparticles, the ability to inject chemicals with in nanoparticles that only dissolve at the point where they are needed to again be more precise, that's one of the other, and, and the list of nanopotentials oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's goes tremendous. on and on, there really is not one.
Um, you mentioned medicine. Now, stem cell research seems to be uh, another thing that we foresee in the future more of. Tell right. me about right. that. Well, stem cells, of course, are cells that we can turn into any other kind of cell. And, and the, the, the issue, of course, is where do we get the stem cell to start with? And there are two main sources. One is from embryos, Embryonic. which is which is the beginning of life. And the other is from adult cells, which are turned, basically, they turn the clock back into stem cells and then can go forward. It's, it's yet unclear whether we have to use. Nobody really wants to use the embryo because of the ethical and moral issues, but it is obvious they're right there. The other is a very very, very strong and active line of research. If we can use just adult cells, then we first of all don't have to go and deal with a very difficult and the delicate process. Of, right. and, and in the process, so we can just kind of scrape somebody's skin off, it's take easier. those cells, and turn them into something. So if I if I have a heart attack and I need to replace muscles in my heart, I can give some, some skin cells, turn back into skin cells, inject it back in the heart, and since they're in the heart, they look around and say, "Oh, I guess I'll become a heart cell," and they grow that muscle back. Right. Now, it sounds like magic, but gee, what technology? when you're just talking about it, it doesn't sound like magic. Right. Are there issues with it? Of course, there's issues with all technologies. But we really think that stem cells will help us repair the parts of the body that become damaged or diseased because of, uh, uh, right. of sicknesses. Now, we t you're talking in a way about health care, and that's such a big problem for sure. America and the world. Uh, it's, it's so expensive. Do you foresee, what scenarios do you foresee? When it, is there going to be a paradigm shift towards prevention? Because we can't afford the system that we have right mm -hmm. now. Well, it's the same way as with oil. You know, people realize that they're, if they were to get a break on their insurance premiums and they were to pay less because they were living smarter, healthier, as, as, you, as you describe, eating and exercise and sleep, none of this is rocket science. Everybody knows what it takes to be healthy. And if, if, it, if it actually not only makes them feel better, but they actually save money doing it, yeah, I think there will be more. But we, we will not prevent all disease. But there are countries of the world that live much more healthily than we do and in that sense, there could be a trend towards that. Now, we are living in an economic crisis. We don't know how long it's going to last. But do you foresee that we can continue the type of leadership economically uh, with, in a consumer-driven society with the issues of climate change and, and the problems that we're having economically? Um, you mean the U U.S. leadership the U.S. In, leadership, in the world? Yes. The, the U.S. Uh, has been an, an engine of uh, world world economic development for ever since World War II, primarily not only as producers, but really as consumers. We spend a lot of money. We shop till we drop, as the saying goes, <laughs> right? So, and, and the rest of the world is happy to make those things, sell those things to us. In right. fact, we probably consume, we do consume more than we actually produce. So I think there needs to be somewhat more balance. Yes, tax cuts and, 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 and giving people more money in their pocketbooks and they go to the mall and they spend it does stimulate the economy, but that's a fairly short term issue. It's how do we be, how do we balance how much we make with right. how much we consume. And, and you know, in a family, you can't go on forever living on the credit card. You can't go on forever living on debt and, and, the, and the home equity. But that's almost what we've done as a country. So we have to figure out how to consume a little bit less. I don't think we're ever going to be poor in my lifetime. But consume somewhat less and at the same time figure out how to produce more so that we have a balance. And just like every other family budget, just like a business budget, you, for a short time, you can run a debt, you can take out a loan, but overall, you have to be able to balance your income and outcome. So we definitely are out of balance. We I have to so. figure out how to become more productive, more innovative, more creative. Um, what about, this is a concern in general about the gap between rich and poor in America. Do you foresee more of that? It has grown, uh, and that's one, unfortunately, one of the un unintended and unfortunate consequences of freeing up the market. The market itself tends to reward people uh, at both ends of the spectrum, uh, all get generally in many ways. The, the poor are not getting poorer, but those people with means, particularly with investment capital, have done extremely well in the last 5, 10, 15 years as the market, as the government has backed off and as we've adopted more of a free market philosophy. Now, as I say, everybody has done okay but a few top percent have done amazingly well, and that creates some amount of distrust and resentment. Why are they making all the money and I'm not? Right. And so there is a, there's a social issue there. We believe in a country not in equality of outcomes, but we right. do believe in equality of opportunity. And if people begin to distrust that, people begin to question that and say, wait a minute, your kids are going to all these great schools and my kids can't because I can't afford it. Now we're getting back to the, the, the differences in, in the equality of opportunity, not just in the equality of outcomes. Everybody doesn't start out the same. If, if we start out more unequal, 
those kids are probably going to end up unequal in most cases across the board. What about education? Is, is, how do we prepare today? Before it was a bachelor's degree, now it's a master's degree. How do we prepare for the future as far as education? What do we need to know? Wow, how many hours do we want yeah, to talk about Yeah, we don't have that? a lot of time, but you mentioned the liberal arts along with technical. You, right, have, to, you right. have to be a whole... Well, clearly, the way to become innovative and the way to become a productive person, part of it is to have the means. You have to have tools, you have to have resources, money, and whatever, but you also have to have the abilities and the talents that it takes. In the old days, basically getting through good old school, raising your hand, doing the right thing, was, uh, was the way to get a job and keep that job for 20 or 30 years. That's, those days are gone. Now we have to have students who are much more independent and able to uh, do things on their own. How do you know you're living smart? How do I know? I think I'm thinking about the long-term future. I'm living in the long-term future much more. I mean, I'm, I'm a kind of person who doesn't like to take short-term. I like to be successful in the long run. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Bishop, for joining us. Thank you. And to learn more about this topic, go to our website. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great futuristic week. A transcript of this program sends 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.